Well, thank you all so much for coming out on this much nicer, balmier day than we've been having recently. As Mum was saying, I have been studying early women filmmakers for a little while now. And in the course of my research, I will be reading articles and I'll come across names and I'll Google them to figure out who they are, what their filmography might have been, uh, if I don't recognize them. And I was reading an article that was mentioning early African-American women directors like Eloise Gis, Zora Neale Hurston, Tressie Saunders, and Maria P. Williams. And I list them just because I think it is so important to always acknowledge the breadth of what is actually out there because we can be so ready to call someone the first or the only and it sounds special and it sounds like that's a good thing but actually it doesn't encourage people to look for more and there are always more out there so jenny is one of the earliest she might possibly be the first but there probably was a woman before her and people need to go out and look and see so in reading this list i came across a name madame uh, to Saint, welcome. And I'm like, haven't come across that. And I put it into Google. And the first site that came up was for the Berkshire Eagle and a wonderful article by Kate Abbott, who is a great local journalist, talking about this figure in film history. I'm like, why is, why is it Kate Abbott that's writing about this? And I looked at the little biography box on the right that Google puts up for you, and it said, born Lenox, Massachusetts, 1885. And I'm like, how did I not know about this person? And I was actually kind of upset because, as Mom mentioned, she went to Lenox High, I went to Lenox High, and no mention of any Van Der Zees happened while I was in Lenox High in the early 2000s. Uh, and so Madame Toussaint Welcome actually was a misspelling of Toussaint Welcome. She has a lot of names, which gets very confusing when trying to standardize who she is. I have gone for Jenny Van Der Zee Welcome, especially because of the Van Der Zee Lennox connection, and I really wanted to emphasize that, us being in Lennox. Her born name was Jane Louise Van Der Zee. She went by Madame Tuissant Welcome. She went by Jenny L. Welcome. She went by Jenny T. Welcome. You have to do a lot of different variations of spelling when searching for her in old newspaper records. Yeah. Jenny was the sister of James Van Der Zee, who is another very fascinating figure in the history of art and also in local history. And James actually did get rediscovered in his lifetime because he lived to be 93 or 96. In 1969, there was a exhibition at the Met of Harlem on My Mind, where one of the curators at the Met really just stumbled upon James's photography studio and realized how many amazing photographs James had took over the course of the 19 teens through the 40s and 50s in Harlem. Um, and his photographs provided the backbone for that exhibition. And since then, James has been well researched. He was interviewed a lot towards the end of his life. There are several biographies of him. This is my favorite, Jim Haskins, Picture Taking Man. And I will be quoting extensively from it because there are almost no interviews of Jenny herself. So a lot of my research is depending, depending either on interviews that James did in his lifetime or um, newspaper and census data. James said, I became interested in photography way back. In fact, all my people were artists and musicians and my sister was still drawing and painting up to the time of her death. We used to paint a good deal up there in Lenox, but after I found out there was such a thing as a camera and you could put people in a position and just press a button and you had the picture, then I didn't do so much drawing and painting. 
Jenny, on the other hand, even though she also discovered that, yes, you can just put people in place and press a button, she was a photographer as well, she definitely continued drawing and painting throughout her life, as he said. So I'm going to take you back to Lenox. First, in the 1880s, um, though this map is technically 1904, and I'm going to take you on a little walk from where we are, right here at Benford Hall, at the bottom of the screen, up Walker Street, here is Trinity Church, which we'll feature, and then we make the turn at Main Street and go up to the Church on the Hill, which we'll also feature quite a lot, and then we go down Hubbard Street, all the way down, and then when we get to these names, we've gotten to Lena Brewster. J.J. Van Der Zee and David Osterhout. And this is the Brewster Egbert Osterhout Van Der Zee compound. And all of those names are one family because it was the women that connected them. So you get a lot of different last names when um, it's the women connecting. They were a very tight knit family, um, all connected to Jenny's mother, Susan Egbert, Susan Egbert Van Der Zee and Susan's mother, Josephine Brister Egbert Osterhout. Um, so Lena Brister was Josephine's sister and Jenny's great aunt. She lived in this house with her sister, Fanny Egbert. J.J. Van Der Zee is Jenny's father, John. Uh, and he and Susan and Jenny and James and Walter and Johnny and Charles and Mary all lived in that house. <laughs> and then David Osterhout is Jenny's step-grandfather, uh, married a long time to uh, her grandmother, Josephine. And they had four daughters um, and a son. So this was the uh, house of Lena Brewster and Fanny Egbert, the great aunts of Jenny. Um, and they had a bakery in Lenox, um, and here's how James described it. My aunts used to make all the bread used for Trinity Church for communion, and they served bread and cakes to the very wealthy people. I remember there were a great many people we used to deliver cakes, bread, and pies to. They even made ice cream, and my brother and I were always anxious to get at that dasher when they pulled it out of the freezer. They had to pack the ice cream in ice and salt to keep it cold and hard, and my father would use the horse and wagon to deliver it. On the other side of the Van Der Zee's property was uh, Jenny's grandmother, Josephine, and her second husband, David Osterhout. And they ran a laundry, and James describes the laundry as they had a very large laundry. A great deal, uh, many of the wealthy people would send their laundry from the Curtis Hotel and even up from the city by horse-drawn carriages. The chauffeurs would bring trunks and hampers of clothes and they would be hand-washed and starched. We'd, ha we'd have to get the water to wash them from the brook. And then we would load the clothes into the wheelbarrow and take them out to be hung on the up in the meadows, and they would come back smelling very sweet with the odor of pines. <laughs> this um, is, as I was saying, a very close-knit family, and they are a family that were living on their own terms in Lenox, and uh, they had their own businesses. David Osterhout, the patriarch of the, the family, was the sexton at the Church on the Hill, and uh, the Pittsfield son described his tenure there at the end of it, saying, David Osterhout Sunday completed 36 years as janitor of the Lenox Congregational Church as, and as sexton of the Lenox Cemetery. Mr. Osterhout has the unique distinction of being the first person to operate a lawnmower in the cemetery, and he estimates that he has dug over a thousand graves in that time. He commenced his duties with, when the Reverend Charles Pankhurst was pastor of the church and has served with fidelity ever since. 
when I was doing the newspaper research, one of the nicest finds um, was in the Pittsfield Sun, this article here that wrote up, and you're only seeing half of the article, wrote up the 25th wedding anniversary of J Josephine and David, and it was a surprise party. Uh, and I do want to read this to you because it just can give you a sense of what a warm, close, and middle-class existence the Van Der Zee, Osterhout, uh, Egbert clan had. A lovely evening was spent at Mr. and Mrs. David Osterhout's Wednesday evening, April 29th. Their children knew it was their 25th wedding anniversary and thought if they could get up a fine surprise for them, uh, it would be just splendid. And so with the help of their aunts, it was a grand success. Uh, and as their mother was away from home that day, not thinking or even dreaming of such a thing, she knew nothing of it until she reached home and everything was in readiness. When she came in, she said, why, what is going on? And they told her it was her wedding, 25th wedding anniversary. She only had time to get ready and receive her guests. It was a great surprise and everyone enjoyed themselves. After the guests had arrived, they asked if Mr. Osterhout knew of it and they were told no, so they were all on guard waiting for him. It being Wednesday night prayer meeting, he s saw nothing of the festive pre preparations when he left home. Of course, he knew nothing of it until he returned, and seeing everything so bright and so many lights in the yard, he wondered what was going on. When he came by the window, he saw the table so beautifully arrayed, he thought surely he must be in the, wr the wrong yard. <laughs> When he came in, he asked what was going on, and he was told, why, Father, this is your 25th wedding anniversary. Now go quickly and get ready. He was more than surprised. The table was beautifully arranged by their children with the help of Mr. Van Der Zee, uh, their brother-in-law, with flowers and two lovely silver candlesticks, which held six candles. They were placed at each end of the table, and the table was filled with rich and deli delicious eatables. The playing and singing was exquisite, and at the stroke of ten, the grand march was played on the piano by their youngest daughter, Estella, and all marched out to the well-filled table. When all were seated, Reverend Mr. Day of the Church on the Hill asked uh, the blessing. Music was played while eating, and between the playing, the Swiss music box was heard, and it was grand. And then there were, was a duet played on the first and second violin accompanied by the piano. When all had finished, the grand march was again repeated, and they went back <laughs> to the pleasant parlor where some of the old songs of 25 years ago were sung by Mr. and Mrs. Osterhout. Um, and Sister Miss Lena Brewster accompanied by guitar. The old songs which they, which they sung were so sweet that they all seemed to enjoy them very much. And there is a list of all of the gifts and the guests which I will not actually <laughs> read, but it was a interesting combination of old Lennox families, both of the ministers from the Church on the Hill, and then also the uh, other African-American families in that area of Lennox. It was a, a completely integrated party and just a lovely one. So this was 1891. So Jenny was at this party and Jenny was six and probably feeling very superior to her five and three year old brothers. So in 1880, John Van Der Zee came to Lennox and in 1882, Susan married John Vandersee. They then moved down to New York City and were butler and maid in the house of Ulysses S. Grant on 3 East 66th Street. And both Susan and John really seemed to have been lovely 
interesting people. Uh, James described his mother saying she seemed to know all about all the different stars and planets. She knew the evening star from the morning star, Mercury from Venus, the Big Dipper, and all that sort of thing. She could always tell by sunset what the next day was going to be like. He used to have a bottle of alcohol with camphor in it for a barometer. At times it would be clear, other times it would seem to be thick on the bottom. She was a very quiet and gentle woman, but she was strong. I was always guided by her influence. A wealthy lady told me one time, Jimmy, your mother is a very smart woman. And James described his father, John, saying, I don't remember ever hearing my mother and father having any contentions or arguments. The worst thing I ever heard him say was, confound it. <laughs> he was a very capable man. He was very quiet and humorous. He was a very good butler and waiter and roundabout man. He had grown up with the better people, always waited on them and served them, and therefore became a gentleman. My father was quite an up-to-date man. He associated with a great many of the better people, and he knew all the answers. But in 1884, Grant uh, was going through some major financial issues, and uh, the Vanderzees left his employ and decided that they were going to start a family. And they moved up to Lenox, back to Susan's family. Sometime between the end of 1884 and the beginning of 1885. Jenny was born January in 1885. There is some unclearness of whether or not she was born in New York or in Lenox. Some census records say that she was born in Massachusetts, some say New York. So there's a lot of mystery, a lot of things that still need to be found out about this story. And um, that's just one of the small ones. But she was up in Lenox by the time she was very young. John then went to work at the bakery of uh, his aunts-in-law, and the family grows. Uh, James came in 1886, and Samuel Walter, who went by the name Walter, in 1887. And at that point, John then, probably with the help of uh, his father-in-law, David Osterhout, ended up being the sexton at Trinity Church. So we have two patriarchs at two different churches maintaining them. And that's what the sexton does. They, they do all of the maintenance on the grounds of the church. Trinity Church was a church in transition at this time. They had just built this, uh, the amazing Romanesque stone building. Um, and it was a lot to maintain, and it was a big job. John was in charge of the maintenance of the, not only the church, but also the parsonage. And when the parish house was built in 1896, he was also in charge of that. It was a heavy, difficult work, and the kids did help with the maintaining of both Trinity Church and also helped their grandfather up at the Church on the Hill. James describes Jenny as a child playing the organ at school. She played the opening song at the beginning of the school day and the closing at the end. There was a pipe organ and some of the boys would pump it and she would sit there with her little legs hanging down playing, now the day is over, the night is drawing near, shadows and the evening time steal across the sky, which leads me to wonder, and again, we don't have records, but did she ever practice on the organ at Trinity Church? There's a beautiful organ there that had just been donated, and the Vanderzees, as you probably have learned by now, were an incredibly musical family. For school, they went to the little public school that was down behind the community center back then. It was a very crowded school at the time, and this photograph actually is from a little later of a different classroom in the academy where the high school was. So it's a classroom that Jenny did attend classes in, but I felt that it was a good illustration of the quote from James saying that teacher would give Jenny a chair to stand on and she'd decorate the blackboards all around the school. 
And so this was a tradition that she was part of. So she did not do these drawings there, but you can see that it was something that was done in the Lenox Public Schools. Jenny and James both excelled in the arts. And James recalled every graduation, we always knew who was going to be head of the class. Music and art, music and art, James and Jenny, James and Jenny. But we never considered that anything. It just happened to be our luck. Uh, James did admit, admit, though, that Jenny was the best student. By the time Jenny was seven, she had already begun painting, and she had four brothers, and the Vanderzees needed a bigger house. And at this point, they bought the lot between Fanny and Lena and the Osterhoots. Fanny Egbert uh, sold the lot to John Vanderzee for $1,200 um, in 1892, and they built the house that you see here. And James describes it. Uh, we had four bedrooms upstairs and a bathroom and an attic above that. And on the floor below, there was a double parlor and a dining room. And later on, my father built an addition and we had a big billiard pool room. He also put in a fireplace and then he put in a, por a porch around the whole place. Made quite a nice place of it. So this house was built mostly by John and John's father came, we hear very little about the Vanderzee side of the family, but John's father did come over from his home in New, New Baltimore, New York, to help with the building of it. In uh, 1895, Jenny's sister Mary was born, um, and she was the youngest, making it a family of six children. But the next year, Jenny's brother Johnny, John Jr., died of pneumonia at six. <coughs> If you've been sort of wondering to yourself and mentally walking down Hubbard Street, wondering where this house is, I will uh, show you. The Van Der Zee house is basically the um, northbound lane of the Route 7 and 20 Lenox Bypass. But you can see in the corner here the Osterhout house, which you could see back there. So the bypass came in in the 1960s and the town bought the property from the Osterhout family in order to make way for it. So as you drive on the bypass, please think of Jenny and James and the whole Van Der Zee clan. I personally think that stretch should be named after them. Um, but, um, yep. <laughs> In 1902, um, changes were coming to Lennox and also to the Van Der Zee family. The Aspenwall Hotel was built up where Kennedy Park is today, and it was an incredibly grand structure, 300 rooms uh, for rent uh, in it. And uh, here you can see the Eagle reporting on the fact that the management will employ colored male waiters. At this time, when the Aspenwall Hotel was built, the work at Trinity Church was getting too heavy for John Van Der Zee. Clearing out the uh, furnace of the church heating system had taken a toll on his lungs, and he was in the start of tuberculosis, actually. So he decided to go back to his experience in service as a waiter. And so he got a job at the Aspenwall Hotel, as did Jenny's brother, James. James also at this time uh, dropped out of school and began experimenting with photography, which was a passion that lasted his entire life. And here you can see a photograph that he took of the Bellmen at uh, the Aspenwall Hotel about 1905. Without the steady employment of Trinity Church, Employment in Lenox was very seasonal, and John van der Zee had to travel around to find work and support the family. This meant that 
this incredibly tight-knit family unit was broken. James and Walter went down to New York City with John, but John would return in the summers. And here is an article from the New York Age, which was one of the leading African-American newspapers of the time, that mentions John J. Vanderzee left on Monday, July 3rd for his country place in Lenox, Mass, where he will remain until November 1st. Now, James's biographers, because they're not really dealing with Jenny, just say, Jenny stayed home the whole time with the younger kids. But actually, Jenny did spend quite a bit of time in Lenox during this time. She entered Lenox High School uh, in 1902 and was there for a year. And she also, uh, sometime around 1905, was hired by Kate Carey to entertain her invalid aunt, Grace Kuhn, who was a friend of Edith Wharton's. And James Van Der Zee, I have a quote from him that gets a lot of the details wrong, including how Kate Perry's name is spelled and saying that it was her mother, not her aunt. There was a wealthy lady, Miss Kate Perry, whose mother was an invalid, and she'd pay my sister to go there and draw and paint as an amusement for them. So this was the first evidence of Jenny pursuing art professionally. And Grace Kuhn lived in the building that was just down from the church on the hill. So Jenny would walk down Hubbard Street from her family compound at this end, all the way to here to Mrs. Kuhn's house under the church on the hill. And it is now the Whistler Inn. So definitely check your attics if there are any um, Jenny paintings. Um, we know that she was working in Lenox and painting in Lenox and it, we want to find her work. There is very little of her work that is extant at the moment, but I know it's out there. So keep an eye out for that. When Jenny turned 18 in 1903, she began pursuing her art education in earnest. Here you can see that she um, continued playing music, which was another passion of hers, and she did a piano solo at the Second Congregational Church in Pittsfield, which was the predominantly African American church there. And there's another solo down there. And then her aunts, Miss Marion and Estelle Osterhout, are also part of this concert. So she was performing around the Berkshires. And then we have also this tantalizing description of Jenny's education. It is from the Chicago Defender, another leading African-American newspaper, and it was published in 1918. And I'll be quoting this uh, article throughout the talk because it's one of the few ones that actually interviewed Jenny herself. Born of a talented family, she has two brothers and a mother living, all artists. She began to paint when seven years of age. Later, she studied in the Kellogg School of Art of Pittsfield, Mass. Graduating, she took a postgraduate course at the Boston Art School and finishing there, studied for, still further under a private tutor, Professor Sargent, who was at one time State Supervisor of Art, State of Massachusetts. So this was a bit of a mystery for me and a bit of a research project because I was just looking at it and being like, the Kellogg School of Art of Pittsfield, Mass. What was that? It was not something I had ever heard of. And then also a postgraduate course at the Boston Art School. Again, a little bit difficult to pinpoint. Kellogg School of, of Art, I did track down, and it was the studio of a local Pittsfield woman, Inez Kellogg, and there is a beautiful description of her studio class in the Pittsfield Sun from 19, uh, 1899. Here she would take on uh, girl students and teach them painting and drawing. Miss Kellogg will open her evening classes Thursday and Friday evenings, November 9th and 10th, when she will have classes in all branches of artwork from charcoal and crayon to mechanical and perspective drawing. And so that seems to have solved the Kellogg School of Art 
the Professor Sargent pretty conclusively does seem to be Walter Sargent, who was a, a painter, a color theorist, and very into art education. He divided his time between North Adams and Boston. So he's an interesting connection between the Berkshires and Boston that we know Jenny was in contact with. But I came up on a dead end when trying to figure out what this Boston art school that she attended was. I can tell you it was not Mass Art, which was then the Normal School of Art of Massachusetts, because I asked them, and they still had their enrollment records. And it is not the Museum of Fine Art School, Boston, either. They also had their enrollment records and were kind enough to look for me. Walter Sargent also taught at the, normal, the North Adams Normal School, which is now MCLA, and I asked them, and Jenny did not appear on their enrollment records. So again, there are still mysteries to be found out. What this postgraduate class she took at the Boston Art School, and just thinking about her as a young woman around 1906, making the trek out from small Lennox to Boston. Um, so it wasn't just her brothers going out and having adventures. Jenny was taking her education very seriously and really was given the opportunity to pursue her passions. Now, to give some faces to all of these names I've been throwing at you, these are photos taken about 1909 in Lenox in front of the family house of the Van Der Zee family. And so at the far right, or left, um, we have Mary, the youngest. Then next to her is Walter's wife, uh, Catherine, and his son, Reginald. In the middle is Susan, the matriarch. Next to her is James's wife, Kate. So there was a Catherine and a Kate. And down here was Rachel, James and Kate's daughter. And here was Jenny. And then of the gentlemen, we have James here at the edge so he could easily go out and adjust the camera. Then we have Walter, the patriarch John, and the youngest uh, son, Charles. So at this point, James and Walter are both married with kids. And the strain of the family separation with John having to go back and forth um, between New York and the Berkshires was getting to be a bit much. And it was also, they, they had a bit of financial instability at that time. Susan mortgages the family home in 1909 and they all decide to move to Harlem. In January 10th of 1910, Jenny herself marries a very important person for the rest of her life, Ernest Tuissant Welcome in Albany, where John had been working some of the time. So I don't quite know what the Albany connection was, but there was some connection. So let me give you a little bit of background on Ernest. Ernest uh, was born in Washington, D.C. in 1879, but moved to Pittsburgh when he was only three. Where, where he, yes, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he grew up and went to school. James describes Ernest, he was a very good promoter. Anything he set his mind to, he was successful at it. And he had the finest bass voice I ever did hear. He should have sung professionally. So Jenny and Ernest had as a connection both their shared talent and love of music and also their shared ambitions. Though I think that Ernest might have been slightly more gung-ho and ambitious even than Jenny. Before he turned 30, he had been a trolley engineer, sold real estate and insurance, was described as a well-known singer, and invented a sewage treatment system, starting the Sewage Disposal and Guano Company of New York in 1909. And there is this long article in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle that describes Ernest's life up until when he met Jenny. He said in it, it was while I was there in Pittsburgh that I perfected my first invention, which was a trolley pole that would not come off the wire. But I had the misfortune that 
faces all new inventors, more or less, and that is to lose my invention. I then started out on another gigantic task to erect a sewage disposal system that was also perfected in the year 1908, an idea which can be seen in Reading, Pennsylvania. I feel like Ernest does tend towards hyperbole. I have not researched the sewage systems in Reading, Pennsylvania. It would be interesting though. The machine, when operated in connection with a sewage disposal system, removes all solids, even the most minute particles from the sewage, thereby freeing potable streams uh, and water supply forever from pollution. So he was a very intelligent, very ambitious, and very good at self-promotion. There is no known photo that I have come across of Ernest, but his draft card in 1918 described him as tall and stout. So with Ernest now part of the family, everyone moves down to Harlem in the spring of 1910. And Jenny and Ernest buy a three stone brown st stone on West 131st, 4th Street, and everyone moves in. Susan, John, James, his family, Walter and his family, Charles and Mary. So again, they were all under the same re roof. And on the ground floor, Jenny was able to start the Tuissant Conservatory of Art and Music, which was something that she really had been building towards her whole life. She and Ernest promoted it heavily. Many copies of this ad were in issues of the New York Age, and I think that we can see uh, Ernest's touch in the most thoroughly equipped Afro-American school of art and music in the state, and uh, also describing Madame E. Tuissant Welcome in Charge, the leading female artist of the race. They also took out ads in the first three issues of the NAACP's magazine, The Crisis, which was started in uh, November 1910 by W.E.B. Du Bois. Now, some of you maybe have been wondering this time if there is a Du Bois connection, and there was, because Du Bois obviously grew up in Great Barrington, and Du Bois would come and visit the Osterhoots. James says, Du Bois used to come up and visit my grandparents' house. I was quite a kid then. They had four girls up there, Susan's half-sisters, and they were an attraction to him at the time. But he didn't marry any of them. In fact, none of them ever got married. Of all my grandparents' children, only two got married, my mother and one, the one brother. It seems to me that the full page ad on the inside cover of the first three issues of the crisis is a way of supporting this new magazine as well as getting the word out. They, the Vanderzees had one happy year reunited in uh, New York City, but then in 1911, tragedy struck. John had had tuberculosis, the father had had tuberculosis for a while, and during 1911, he was pretty well confined to his room. James describes a very strange moment where James had a bit of a hallucination while his father was sick, and he describes it here. My father was in a room at the top floor in the back. He was sick and hadn't been out of that room for I don't know how long. One morning when I was in my studio, I noticed he passed by the door. Before I could say anything, he went upstairs. He didn't say anything, just passed by, carrying the cup he used to expectorate in. So when I went downstairs that day, I said to my mother, Pop have much of an appetite this morning? She answered, I haven't taken his breakfast up to him as yet. I said, didn't he eat when he was down here? My sister kicked me under the table and said, Jim, you know father hasn't been out of that room for months. We got into a red hot argument about that, but I never asked him about it. He was very sick. He died at school of music and art in the private building there, my sister's school. Then in June of that year, the younger brother, Charles, died of pleurisy while working up in Stockbridge. He was 18. At the end of 1911, 
the youngest child, Mary, fell off a chair while reaching into a closet and injured her stomach and died at the age of 16 in January of 1912. So the family really was rocked by an, an incredible series of tragedies that year. Walter then moved to Jamaica, Queens with his family. James moved down to Newark, New Jersey to work in a photography studio. And Jenny, Ernest, and Susan moved the Toussaint Conservatory to a larger space on 140th Street. But Jenny's mother, Susan, stayed with Ernest and Jenny for the rest of her life. They always lived together. Now, Jenny was really working in earnest as an artist then. And the Chicago Defender describes her studio as saying, here a profusion of pictures, all the personal work of the artist greeted the eye. Subjects that varied from prize fighters to ministers, from home scenes to b battle ones greeted the eye. This is the one extant <laughs> Jenny van der Zee welcome painting. It was sold at auction in, uh, on May 6, 2018, and that's why I could find it by searching online. But again, check your attics. I know she has more paintings out there, and I really want to see more of them, but you can see her signature at the bottom, and this is a painting I think probably done from a photograph of the San Francisco Exposition, though potentially she went there. Now, the most famous of her works of art, though, is a lost painting, but we do have a reproduction of it, which is The Charge of the Colored Division Somewhere in France. 1918 was the year of Jenny's greatest success as an artist. And in general, 1918 was a really important year for Jenny professionally. That is the year that this Chicago Defender article that I've been quoting from was published, and I did email the Chicago Defender being like, do you happen to have this photograph still in your archives? I got no response, but that is a photograph of her painting. And this is an incredible article which calls her a genius. And it says, uh, only last week she finished a painting six feet long, four feet high for a wealthy New York family in the church of the Seventh Day Adventist 131st Street and 7th Avenue, a picture 10 feet long and 9 feet high of river scene may be seen. It is Madame Tuissant's work and has been much admired by many, and many of the local theaters, dining rooms, etc. Much of this talented young lady's work may be found. It might also be said that Madame Tuissant is as talented musically as she is with the brush. As the reporter left the studio, he was much impressed with the simplicity and cordiality of this artist, a real genius. The same day as this article was published, the charge of the colored division was accepted to be turned into a war bond poster. And it was the only World War I uh, war bond poster to be designed by an African-American artist. The uh, Chicago Defender describes Jenny's facility as a visual storyteller in that article describing the charge of the colored division being part of a series of paintings depicting the same soldier in various settings from leaving home to being nursed back to health. And this facility for storytelling leads into the next phase of Jenny's career, which is the one that brought me to her in the first place which is her film, Doing Their Bit, which was a collaboration between her and Ernest. As you could see from the painting, Jenny was very involved in the effort of helping give recognition to the African-American soldiers fighting in World War I, and Doing Their Bit was a big part of that. It was released, it appears, April 1st, 1918, and we are so lucky that there is this review from the New York Age that describes the contents of at least the first episode of it. And part of the reason why we are so lucky is that doing their bit is a lost film. A full three quarters of all of the silent films are lost. 75% of 
silent films are just lost. And when it comes to independent documentary works like this that are made by small studios, especially minority studios, the percentage of those films that are lost is huge. But you can sort of reconstruct some of what the film was through reviews. And here you can see, doing their bit, the latest motion picture to be gotten out by a colored concern was shown at the Lincoln Theater, which I have a photograph of there, the first half of the week, and proved to be one of the strongest drawing cards that the theater has had for some time. It is the most credible film ever gotten out in the interest of the colored American, and certainly the most inspiring. Doing their bit is a two-reel war picture showing to great advantage our colored troops, and no criticism can be made of it from the standpoint of photography. Among the many features shown by the film are the parade of the 367th Regiment up Fifth Avenue in Harlem on Saturday, March 23rd, which was only a few weeks before the film was released. The presentation of the stand of colors to the regiment in front of the Union League Club, Governor Whitman making the presentation speech, the parade of the battalion of the 367th Infantry down Fifth Avenue in a blinding snowstorm on Washington's birthday, the dedication of the Buffalo Auditorium at Camp Upton with Acting Secretary of War Crowell taking part, colored troops drilling at Camp Upton and Camp Dix, foreign Negro soldiers reviewed by General Joffrey and other prominent French officers, a boxing contest in France between Bob Scanlon of the American Legion and a French soldier, and a picture of Emmett J. Scott, special assistant to the Secretary of War, leaving the War Department after a strenuous day's work. The Tuissant Studios, 438 Lenox Avenue, they moved to Lenox Avenue, New York, is putting out the picture, and there was, is every indication that the film will be in great demand by all theaters throughout the country, which has a large colored clientele. And I read you that in its fullness because all of the moments in it are documentable moments. And so I've tried to reconstruct the film through photographs and uh, newspaper clippings so you can get a sense of what it was. So the Buffalo Auditorium at Camp Upton was an enormous auditorium that cost $40,000 uh, to build, and 14000 of that was raised by the regiment themselves. So they felt a great ownership of this amazing space. At the dedication, W.E.B. Du Bois spoke and Emmett J. Scott, who was Booker T. Washington's right-hand man and the highest ranking African American in Woodrow Wilson's administration. Another thing mentioned was the parade on Washington's birthday in a blinding snowstorm. You cannot see the snowstorm at the moment, but you can see that they are all bundled up and the presentation of the colors at the Union League Club, and then the parade with the colors now in the lead, uh, in the big parade on March 23rd, which was the most recent event in the film. The description in the New York Age of this parade says, while watching up, wa marching up Fifth Avenue, the buffaloes walked erect, looking neither to the left nor right, all eyes were straight ahead and every chest expanded. The ever genial Lieutenant Cooper, who has been in the army for 20 years or more, looked as though he would burst had he extended his chest half an inch more. <laughs> but when the regiment reached Harlem, there was less military rigidity. The soldiers, when called by their Christian names, would turn their heads and smile to acquaintances accosting them in familiar fashion, and there were, was a general disposition towards relaxation. In Harlem, the 367th Infantry Band and the, 7th, or the 15th Battalion Band put aside their music march and saturated the air with ragtime, much to the light of the thousands of reviewers who thoroughly enjoyed the selections. 
So that gives you a picture of what this movie might have contained. And all of those things that I have listed potentially could have been filmed by either Jenny or Ernest, both of whom at various times advertised themselves as photographers. The other option is they could have been getting in newsreel footage from other establishments and then editing them together. Both would be a very legitimate way of making a film. The parts of the film that were described that absolutely couldn't have been filmed by Jenny and Ernest were the fight with Bob Scanlon, the Emmett J. Scott leaving the war department after a strenuous day's work, though they could have potentially filmed the colored troops drilling at Camp Upton and Camp Dix. Um, and here you can see a photograph of the troops at Camp Upton. Now, th this was an important thing that Jenny and Ernest were doing with the Tuissant Studios. The editor of the New York Age, Lester Walton, commented in an op-ed, in several op-eds, about how African-American soldiers have been depicted in other newsreel and film situations. And he says, at no time has the colored soldier been shown as a man. And this is a really powerful op-ed about representation and how important representation is. If ever you want to get a real look at what things really were like in a particular era, reading the African-American newspapers at the time can give you another perspective on how people were feeling and what was considered actually acceptable at the time. And a lot of what we say, oh, it was just the time, that's just the way it was. Actually, there were people out there protesting them. Lester Walton also wrote an op-ed about how all of the movies that had African-American characters would have them speaking in dialect, even though he knew all of the actors and he knew that they could speak speak English not in dialect, and that actually speaking in dialect is very difficult and can be used effectively, but the people writing the intertitles did not know how to write in dialect, and so it was both wrong and offensive. All of this stuff in the New York Age was in April, and then Jenny and Ernest did a blitz in the Chicago Defender in June of 1918 for doing their bit. And at this point, they are describing it as 12 sterling chapters of two full reels each, which would be half an hour each, released on the first of each month. I don't know how many of these were made. The only one that I confirm was definitely made was the one that I described that was reviewed in the New York Age. But there are potentially up to 12 I have a feeling that that was, again, Ernest's hyperbole. Um, they, they maybe hoped to do 12, but I think the fact that they are advertising it this way several months later, that they had at least done several. So again, more mysteries about this film and hopefully somewhere out there, because there is the review, someone will be able to find it. Because a lost film does not necessarily mean that it's gone permanently. Many are gone permanently, but many do get found. But things can't get found until people know that they are lost. And so it could potentially be somewhere in an archive. So during all of this time, though, you might think that what I have described was enough for Jenny and Ernest to be doing, running a music conservatory, painting paintings, releasing movies, being photographers. But actually, they had a whole other career running concurrently at the same time, and it gets pretty confusing because the other career was mostly in Queens, New York, in Jamaica, Queens. And that was as real estate agents. <laughs> Ernest had dabbled in real estate when he was in Pennsylvania. Here you can see an article in the New York Times which is describing their company, the Douglas Realty Company, as being the first bond and mortgage company in the state of New York in which Negroes alone are interested, received its certificate of incorporation yesterday. Now, 
I don't know, if, I'm always skeptical whenever any paper says the first, because often it's the first that the journalists could think of, especially in this era. But this does give you a sense that this is 1914. At the same time, they are fully working in Jamaica, Queens real estate. In 1913, Jenny and Ernest helped open up parts of Merrick Park Garden in Queens to black home ownership. This was working at an incredibly challenging time in real estate for African Americans. Racial covenants were very popular in the very deeds of many, many buildings and building lots. And these deeds literally would state that they could be inhabited only by members of the Caucasian race. So being able to get lots that did, were not racially covenanted and getting them into the hands of African-American homeowners owners was huge. This al along with redlining that came in in the 1930s meant that there was a huge home ownership gap between black and white Americans. And redlining was the US government literally not insuring loans for areas that were considered less desirable. Generally, all there needed to be to be designated less desirable was to have the area be predominantly minorities. So while it is less glamorous, Jenny and Ernest's work in real estate is actually hugely important and a really big legacy that she has left. But they were still maintaining a presence in Harlem up through the 20s. And here you can see an uh, article about uh, African-American businesses on Lenox Avenue and specifically pointing out a woman conducts studio. Another photograph studio this block is the Tuissant studio at 451 Lenox Avenue. Madame Tuissant Welcome, pri proprietor of this studio, is one of the best known artists of the race. During the last war, Madame Welcome won distinction for her celebrated painting, The Charge of the Colored Division, which was accepted by the government as a war poster. Now, of course, Ernest is also um, doing something too at this time, and he is described as owner of the Tuissant Auto Corporation is in this building too, and was organized a year ago by E. Tuissant Welcome. The company proposes to build a garage and repair shop and to operate sightseeing tours among colored people of Harlem. The Frederick Douglass Sightseeing Company has been merged with the Tuissant Auto Corporation and the three large sightseeing cars of this company will soon be operated again by the Tuissant Company. The company also plans to go into the trucking business and buy and sell vegetables and produce for the local market. Ernest always being um, very, very ambitious. And I think as an African-American businessman in this time, he had to be. He had to go get and he had to work hard. He also at this time entered politics. <laughs> and I would like to find out more about his tenure in politics in Jamaica, Queens, but there is very little, only little breadcrumbs that I've found throughout. They did run into a rough patch, though, in 1922, and they left Harlem at that point and moved permanently to Jamaica, Queens. Here you can see a little reference of Jenny Welcome sold to Rose Dumont, 451 Lenox Avenue, a three-story house, just a little thing in the real estate column. And then a quite snarky New York Age piece about how the uh, Tuissant studio still was, uh, continued getting commissions for photos up until the day that they closed and saying that uh, people with orders for pictures not delivered can get in touch with Ernest at his home in Jamaica, Long Island. But I'm sure that that was a very tough decision to do. But Jenny did continue the conservatory in Queens until she died. 
And they continued starting businesses. And here is uh, another one, the Long Island Scavengers that they set up in 1927. And one detail that I think is really interesting is the list of incorporators, which are Jenny L. and Ernest T. Welcome and Susan Vanderzee, all of 220 New York Avenue, uh, Jamaica. So Susan, the mother, was still involved in the business decisions that they were doing, and they were all working together. Susan really was a constant in Jenny's life, and she died in 1931, a week before her 75th birthday. James describes, that was a shock because she hadn't been sick. My sister called me up and said that my mother wasn't feeling good and when was I coming over? I decided I'd better go right away. So after we closed up the studio, we went out there, but by the time we arrived, she'd been dead two or three hours. She died of shortness of breath. I guess just ran out of breath. Then in 1940, Ernest also passed away at 65 leaving Jenny alone out in Jamaica, Queens. But she still continued running the real estate business and the Toussaint School. And here you can see a series of her turning up in various articles. And she continued uh, playing music. She did get to see herself celebrated within her lifetime, which is always wonderful to see. In 1953, Jenny was lauded in the New York age as a pioneer, and it was in the end because of her real estate business. So here she is in this wonderful article describing her career in real estate. Mrs. Welcome came to New York from Massachusetts. Her hobbies are painting, music, and the arts. Her business motto is, do unto others as I would have them do unto me, God being my helper. Even as she approaches the twilight of a great and exciting career, she is still very active in musical, religious, and community activities, sometimes referred to, and deservingly so, as the Dean of Negro Brokers throughout Queens County and a champion fighter for human and democratic rights. Um, so she died on July 22nd at the age of 71 in 1956. And I want to leave you with this quote from James. Whenever I think of Jenny, I think of children. Whenever I think of children, I think of Jenny. She always had a house and yard full of children. She'd teach them painting and drawing and music and wouldn't charge any fee. She was just interested in their learning. I'm so sorry I didn't realize I went so far over time. I couldn't catch your eyes. It yeah. was so great. And now I, I'm sure that there are lots of questions. I'm thinking that the tea is yeah. ready and people come and talk to Nanina uh, with questions. Um, rather than holding everybody here in case some of you have to get someplace else. But um, thank, thank you, you everyone though for <laughs>